I wasn't sure that I would be here today because um, sometimes every few weeks I take a weekend off and uh, we were in the middle of trying to get Naomi back home so we went to Indianapolis to shop for school clothes yesterday and uh, when I talked with the fellows I couldn't quite determine what the Lord would have me do. They weren't uh, pressing me about anything. Brother Helm hadn't called about anything. So it almost got to the place of choice. And I didn't want to choose wrongly. But the thing that finally helped me to know that in spite of the fact that the family's packing now and getting ready to leave just as soon as I get home, when I heard that Sandy and Ellie were going to be here, I said, that's a deciding factor for me. By God's grace, I cannot be gone if Sandy and Nellie and some of their families are going to be here with us today. I just had to be here. I just had to see them. And you know, Robert, your love is so special, your love for them and their love for you. But they've loved us like we, we, till I feel just like you do. Yeah, and I think you do too, don't you? I just feel like I, it's so special. By God's grace, his love for Sandy and for Nellie and for some others in a real special rim, you know. But they love us till we feel the same way. That's the way we feel when we're with them. And so to see them, that was what pulled me over the line. And I said, well, Jesus, I believe I'll take that as guidance. And I'm coming because I cannot miss them. And here I am preaching. I, th- I, think, I think I'm the most least wanting to preach man in the whole world. I think I am. Then when I meet somebody that wants to preach less than me, I'm going to look at him real good. Because, uh, real well, because I, I, it seems like the, I was born an extrovert, but the longer I live, the more introverted I become. I don't know why God's working with me that way. But I was born as an outward person, and it seems uh, as we try to walk with God that not that we're interned, it's not that, but we just get quieter. And so I don't have much desire to preach, and yet I've preached maybe 12 or 13 times since I've been here. All the while remembering that I was not called here primarily to preach, but to pray. The primacy of our being here, the Holy Spirit said, come and pray. And uh, so we have that in focus and we have that in mind. But then again, uh, the assignment of the book of Hebrews was given to us. I've thought about these things. What's the rationale? You know, not wondering in a carnal way, but knowing that something's deeper, something's more important than what we realize. And I think back to the assignment two and a half years ago when I said to Brother Ham, after I've been preaching on Romans two and a half years, what would Jesus have me preach now? Now, Romans was a difficult assignment. It's one of the hardest books in the, all of the New Testament. And uh, uh, so when I finished it, then he said to me, Vera, I think you were there with us. And he said, well, have you thought about preaching on Hebrews? Well, of course I hadn't, because I hardly know anybody that chooses Hebrews. And I read yesterday in one of the newest commentaries, that Hebrews is the least chosen and the least preached upon in all the Bible. That's really something. The least one of all the books of Scripture. At least it's one of the least. There's a few others that are neglected there, maybe some of the shorter books. But it's one, it's one of the most important books. It's the only one that explains the priestly ministry of Christ. Paul alludes to it a time or two and may have been back of this precious book here. But um, uh, it's the only one that pr- explains the high priestly ministry of Christ. It really is the book of meat. And maybe that's why it's neglected. It's the least understood book. Maybe the least appreciated book. But it's the book of meat. And he says so. He said, you've become dull of hear- hearing. You're like children. But in essence, he says, I'm going to feed you this meat anyway. Because you need it for the hard days ahead. And of course, the waiting on God, I'm, I'm, I'm astounded that whenever the Lord said to preach, that the seventh chapter of Hebrews would be in my mind, because it's the Melchizedekian priesthood, and I had some, something, I had some structure in mind to preach. But when we prayed, when Brother Helm prayed with me over the various chapters, 
then the Holy Spirit operate on the fourth chapter, the least in my mind of, the, of all the chapters. And I thought it was something. I'm watching these things myself. And yet as I stood to preach, there was one thing I could remember. There was one thing that he would bring to me, and that's the part where he says, and I was quoting from the Hebrew, Oh, that men would hear my voice today and not harden their hearts. See, that would come to me. And so there's where my inspiration was and my sermon was around that. Not even on the latter part. Having uh, then this priest let us come into this throne room boldly and let us obtain mercy and let us find grace for help in time of need. And that's a great passage because this is a vacillating and a backing up people. They're not... They've, they've not turned back, but they're in, the, they're in a whirl, they're in a whirl, and they're in a decision, and yet he invites them in to obtain mercy and to find grace for help in time of need. That's a mighty important passage, and we've used that passage in our preaching if we haven't used the rest of the book very much. Now, in looking at the ninth chapter today, let me say first of all, I just began to look at it and explore it. Uh, and there's a lot of exciting things and there's a lot of puzzling things in here, or at least several things to me. So I'm not really prepared to handle something masterfully. I don't know that God would want me to preach if I were. But uh, you might just, you might explore with me. You remember the way Emory preached last Sunday night, Brother Emory? He just sort of mused along, you know. Well, I got more at it than I do a lot of sermons. I just simply am still feeding on it. I fed on I fed on his search for God. I fed on his wonderings about these things. I think there's 70 persons acquainted with the Apostle Paul in scriptures here that he mentions by name or just mentions about someone. So there was a lot of people around the Apostle, and yet we read that at his in his final days there was almost no one around him. I, I cannot get over that. I cannot get over that the hardest thing for men to do was to drop their own interest and and be interested in Paul. In in Philippians, Philippians, for instance, he said, I have no man like minded save Timothy who will care for your interests. For all care for their own interests. Now, these, these are church people. They all care for their own local congregations. They all care for any but but if, if there's a higher interest at stake, then a lesser interest becomes invalid. See, even though it's totally, even though it's, even though it's all in general in the kingdom work. Luther said it this way. If you're on the front line, but you're not standing where the battle's taking place, you're not in the army at all. Mm-hmm, that's right. It's invalid. That's what Luther said. Now, why did Luther say that? Because he was on the front line at times almost by himself. And even the German princes who were with him were there more for political reasons. Many of them, they were there for spiritual reasons. He was by himself. Here were all these men of God out there. And Luther was on the front line. Justification by faith. And having been on the front line, he found himself by himself, so he gave us a spiritual rule. This great man, at an anointed moment, he said, I can see that if I'm not where the battle's taking place, I'm not on the front line at all. And it's, it's really something to observe these things in Scripture. I was watching Emory, you know, reason along these lines. When, um, when um, Demas left him for the light of the world, went for the lights of Thessalonica. Why well, such a sad chapter? I don't know whether Demas had known his name was going to be in Scripture forever and forever. I don't think he knew that when he left out there. But God's writing all the time. And he, sees, he sees what I do. He sees what I'm observing. Um, so um, whoever wrote this book wrote it to a church or a small church. The church was really never seemingly never more than small in these various places and yet very important. And he wrote it to them that they would, that they would come out of their halting experience, that they, would, that they would press forward and lay aside these weights and certainly the sin, which thus easily beset them, and run with endurance. Sandy said it a while ago. Run with endurance. And um, the, the hardest battles come before the greatest victories, the men of God told me. And that tells us good things. 
And here this book was assigned to me by the Holy Spirit, not by him. I, I think he must have been surprised. But as he went through it, because I've never heard him preach much out of this book. Nevertheless, the Holy Spirit said I was to try. And we're in the eighth chapter. Now we're in the ninth. And we're just beginning to study the ninth. Now when I say that, I mean it because um, these first few verses are going to be on, on the Old Testament tabernacle. And there's a lot that we need to know about it. I don't know very much about it. Now I'm having to learn about it. Jesus is wanting me to learn about it. So I'm going back and reading in Exodus 25, reading in Exodus 35, and I'm reading these things with, uh, with great interest. Well, I've heard the preachers like you have. I've heard them, but I didn't pay a lot of attention to the details they were saying. But when you have this responsibility, you, you pay a lot more attention to the details. And you, you start wondering about the candlesticks, and you start wondering about the showbread, and you start wondering about the incense, and... And uh, you pay more attention to the mercy seat. I've paid quite a bit of attention to that through the years. So uh, I'm just beginning to learn, just beginning to understand, just beginning to scratch and understand that. And we'll get here into the ninth chapter and, and ask Jesus to feed our souls here this morning. Isn't it wonderful to get lost as a people in, in the presence of God? When we come together at the Scott Depot, the best thing that can happen to us is for us really to forget every person in there distinctively. Yeah, God doesn't forget us, but I mean in our, in our focus upon Christ. So if the whole service comes to rest, and along in the service we find that in following Him, the attention of all believers are upon Christ. See, it's a great thing, and it brings such rest, and it just... Oh, it just helps us so wonderfully to find as you attempt to follow him. After a while, there you are, caught up as a whole congregation before Jesus. And Jesus is here this morning directing us and helping us. But I pray that the flesh will fall away and that he will, he will feed us. Because one word, one word knocks the devil. Luther saw that. One little word shall fail him. One little word shall break open the gates of hell. And we need that word because we live by God's word. So every word that comes out of the mouth of the Father, that's what we live on. So every morning I'm looking for God's word. That's why our scripture lessons are so important, our family devotion. Every morning we need fresh word from God. So we just tend to fall so easily to the right or left. Not out into deep sin so much as it is just fall slightly out of the perfect will of God, slightly out of his will, and just need tuned up so much. And his word tunes us up, brings us back, and it cleanses us and helps us. So may he, may the Holy Spirit anoint, even as we read him, because it may be some word for you that you're certainly not looking for. It may be for me. Usually it's that way. Ninth chapter reads like this of Hebrews. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship. And also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. Keep in mind that the temple was in operation then. That is the temple was. Uh, the, the, the sacrifices were taking place in the temple. But the writer to the Hebrews goes back to the tabernacle. For we know the tabernacle before Christ was the perfect will of God. And the tabernacle was made after the pattern that Moses saw. Solomon had a plan too. And he saw what God would do, but it's obvious from Scripture that the temple was not primary in God's mind, even as a king was not primary. The theocracy was what he wanted, but they asked for a king, then he chose the king. But he, he, he was pleased with the tabernacle, and the tabernacle was set up that God may come and dwell uh, amongst the people there. And it says in its first room, were the lampstand. I have the NIV, it says candlestick, but the NIV translates its lampstand, and that's probably connotes more correctly what it is because it actually was a lamp. Rather than a candle that burns itself away, it was a lamp that was fed by oil. And the candlestick, you know, had seven lamps. And we could say a lot about that, but even the writer here says we cannot discuss these things in detail now. But so we'll go on and say maybe a thing or two when we finish this passage here. 
A tabernacle was set up, and in its first room was the lamp stand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Now, can you imagine what I've been thinking about here on Aaron's staff that had budded? For God to prove that Moses, when the one actually called, that was so important that he had this budded staff placed in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I've been thinking about that in the last few hours. Along with the tablet stones, what I want to do is set your mind to thinking. Maybe you'll tell me under Revelation. Maybe Jesus will teach you what it's all about. But I can see why the stone tablets were placed there. And I can see why the gold char of manna, that is, it, it, it impresses me. But to think that, that the rod that budded to prove that Moses was the one who was really in charge, he would want that in the Ark of the Covenant? Now, that, that's really something. And I don't have the answer. I have a thought or two, which I'm not willing to give at this time. But I think about that. You think about that. Sure, he put the stone tablets in there written by the finger of God in the manner that came down supernaturally. But he said, I want something else in there. I want this rod that budded. No other rod budded. All 12 tribes but a rod. Those rods were given back. But Aaron's rod was taken and placed in the Ark of the Covenant. And what was the, what was the significance of rod? That God had called Moses, not Korah. That God had called Moses... Not someone else. Right. Moses was the one called. Oh, yeah. Think of that. Miriam, not Miriam, oh. not Aaron. Aaron. Miriam challenged it once oh, yeah. and, and got leprosy. Oh, leprosy. Moses was able to pray for her in about a week. Right. But that's very important. And oh, never thought of it in my life till this week. Why is uh, Aaron's rod in there? Tremendous. Tremendous. Well, I, a hint. Or, a hint is that whom God calls, he calls. And woe be unto us if we try to put our own rod. See, woe be unto us. It must be very, once he makes the calling clear, woe be unto us if we try to usurp that call. See, it's a tremendous thing. But I didn't know it was that important until I was looking at it this week. See, I have a hint. This is like Emory a little bit, musing. I say, oh, Jesus, help me not to usurp thy calling. By God's grace and by God's mercy. Serious thing to, to try to usurp a pastor. Serious thing to try to yeah. usurp a yeah. spiritual leader. So serious. Yeah. And God wants to help us very much by his grace and mercy. Now that's only a hint, but that's an important hint. Uh, I think about my father's past life. That comes to my mind. I go, oh, Jesus, if, if they had known who my father was, what a difference yeah. it would have made. When dad had a congregation in Portsville, Missouri, and God blessed it. We went up over 300, and that was big in the early 50s. All of a sudden, the leading member of the congregation felt like they needed the leading, most popular preacher in all the movement. And my dad saw the handwriting on the wall, and he said goodbye. And here was his, here was his obedience that brought to prosperity. Here God had helped wonderfully. But my daddy was a humble man, and he, he wasn't at all times. He wasn't the greatest fire in the pulpit. They tell me he's got quite a bit fire at home right now. I'm kind of thrilled about it. Said he's, said he's coming in at the age of 76, going on 77. And it's coming in pretty heavy on his feet. I mean, walking pretty brisk. And he's exhorting. And it's uh, helping them wonderfully. But I see, I remember when the challenge came to his ministry. And, and, and I thought, oh, but Daddy so graciously just, uh, well, praise the Lord. Thank for what God did. Goodbye. He was gone. I don't know what the judgment's going to say about that. Don't know what the judgment's going to say about the neglect of my own father. I've tried not to neglect him, and uh, whoever the man of God is, and part of my reason for being here is to is to help him because I knew the responsibility. When I thought about Sandy and Nellie being here, and I, I just thought of his responsibility. And I thought, well, Jesus, maybe you can get in there if I can help John a little bit by God's grace. Maybe that can pull me in since I'm in the place of my own choice. You know, so it looks like God's giving my own choice here. By his grace and his mercy. Now you almost got a sermon right there. 
Almost had something so important that if you got a hold of it, it'll save you a lot of trouble. It'll save a lot of heartache for, for, for the future as God leads and God's help us. Oh, bless his holy name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But it goes on to say that the ark, uh, or that is, uh, after Aaron's staff and the stone tablets of the covenant, above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. Now, that doesn't mean that you and I can't go back and think over this. What he's done, they're well acquainted with all of this. But as he mentions these most important things about the most holy place, two-thirds of the temple itself or the tabernacle, and the, uh, the, well, the holy place and the most holy place, about one-third, as he mentions the, these, it, it stirs their memory. Because they're well acquainted with it. He hits the high points and it stirs them. Think of it now. They said there was a beautiful, uh, uh, there was a beautiful candlestick or lamp stand in there. And I haven't had time to go over the other stuff. I've been through the showbread. I know there was 12 loaves arranged in six each. I know they were there for one week. I know that only the priests could eat of them. I know it stands for the Word of God or seems to stand for the Word of God. I understand that and I'm working on some of the other things. I don't know what God may show us, but I've looked over the candle stand. And I've tried to figure out how in the world you could take a block of go and take a hammer and pound it out until it had seven lamps pulling out from the side. I mean, one block of go. I don't know how big it was. I know that Barclay says it would cost 5,000 pounds and about 50. And I don't know what that is now, but I've, I've been from estimates all the way from 100,000 to a million dollars if you pay the artist fees. 700,000 in gold. If you, if you translate 125 pounds of gold, oh, yeah. see, into what it is, that was quite a block. Oh, and how he ever took, and you know, do you know that no artisan can do it now? No one. There's not a jeweler, there's not a person in all the world that can hammer out that, can hammer that uh, block of gold into a lampstand like that. And if you want to know what it was like, Probably the closest we can come to it is the uh, picture of where Titus raided Jerusalem and went in and got the candlestick. And you could see that in some of your books today. That menorah is probably very much like the one that was in the temple. But how he could pound that, I've thought about that. I've thought about how gold is and how its purity, as it's pounded out, it can be almost stretched indefinitely, go a long, long way, you know. I've thought about those things. I thought about the light that was in the holy, the, the holy place. But no one else saw the light. I thought about the candle that stood in there. But we, we never were in there. Neither were they. All, all any of us ever have is a report. That's all we have. I mean, it's almost like you see it. But you don't. And so uh, they never saw it. They never saw it. It was inside. And the light shone before the table... Uh, for the showbread and the altar of incense being over here or the uh, incense or censer was over here just before you go into the most holy place and inside the most holy place here is the throne of mercy and here are the cherubim on each side of the throne of mercy and the, when you study those elaborate details and how the smoke had to go up constantly and how he had to slay a bullock for himself to go in on the day of atonement and then how he had to go back and get two scapegoats and uh, put the sins of people on one of those scapegoats, and one was sacrificed to God, and the other was sent out into the desert and killed, thereby symbolizing the removal of the sins in order just to make them ceremonially clean. And there's a puzzling passage on over here. I haven't gotten to it yet. It talks about a heifer being killed. There's no heifer killed in the in the uh, in the uh, tabernacle. There was only a heifer killed outside the camp when somebody came in contact with a dead body. It's quite a thing. And he uses the slaying of the heifer to tell us that we have to be cleansed from our dead works. That's further on in this. In th we're so deep into it till only God could ever get us out. But as we get a, <laughs> as we get a little glimpse of it along, who knows? He may put it all in place after a while. Was he, wasn't he the one on the road to, the road to Damascus that opened the scriptures up to him and explained, helped them to understand all things? I'll say that must have been a great day. And when God does that, when he gives you understanding... And he gives you revelation. Oh, you want to appreciate it. You want to be thankful. And you want to hold on to it forever. Because whatever he reveals and whatever he explains stands 
uh, when the world's on fire and thereafter by God's grace and mercy. Well, they, they, whenever the writer to the Hebrews spoke to these people in Rome, one thing it did, it reminded them of the glory of God. It reminded them of the glory that was Israel's. It reminded them of a, of a, of a lampstand that they had never seen. It reminded them of the priest that went in to the most holy place and once a year the high priest. And that's where we are now. But when he gets there in his writing, there's a shadow or there's the sign of limitation that comes to him. Look, read with me on here beginning with the sixth verse. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed. As long as the first tabernacle was still standing, this is an illustration for the present time. Get Remember the condition of the Roman church. They, they, were, they were starting to back up. Now, having heard the reports from the priests, there was a desire for them to know God's presence for themselves. There was a light, the desire for them not only to see the light, but to shine as lights if that represents them. For in Revelation, he talks about the preachers of the churches being the candlesticks. And Christ walked amongst them. I don't know if that's, the, if that's the revelation of what this is or not. But I know that, that uh, when the priests entered the holy place, they came close to the glory of God. But once a year, the high priest went into the most holy place, right into the very presence of God. The blood, he went in first and put the blood out for himself. Then he went back in after the goats were slain and put the blood, sprinkled blood for the sins of the people. And God's hand was stayed. And at least they were ceremonially clean and pointing to a time when something greater would come to pass. The writer of the Hebrews reminds them of this glory. At the same time, he says to them, the fact that a man could come in only once a year. And the fact that only one man could come into God's presence only once a year. And the fact that he could never enter without blood. All these showed that the way to God's presence had not been revealed. The thing that we needed most, the longing of the prophets, the longing of our hearts. See, all the aches we have this morning, I was thinking about your cares, not mine. I was thinking about yours. I was thinking about in your own realm, your cares are as important or more important than mine. And your pain and your suffering is as important or more important than mine. But I was thinking about how Jesus loves us and cares for us all. And the, and the real answer to all of this is living in the presence of God. The real way through all this is following the Spirit of God. Right. And yet, in the Old Testament, it could not be done. It could be explained in general what they needed to do. The tabernacle was in their midst and they followed Moses. But as far as the people themselves ever having what the experience of the high priest had, and by the way, his experience was somewhat tempered by the fact that he was in terror. When he would go into the presence of God, he thought he had done everything right, but if he went in presumptuously at all, he died. And the bells on his garments quit ringing. The very very presence of God and to experience God's presence in doing all of this he reminds them that under the old dispensation they were extremely limited only one man experienced God's presence once a year and he did it after the shedding of the blood of many animals there was a great price paid and uh, as it says here once a year only one man and never without blood not only that in order for him to avail for the sins of the people, he had to offer an offering for himself first. Now, he's leading up to something because he's been trying to convince them that what has been revealed to them is a better uh, way than, than what they're about to go back to. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience 
of the worshiper. They are only, they are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. So, he said to them, I remind you of the great glory of the tabernacle. But I remind you that as glorious as it was, it was extremely limited. The way to God's presence was blocked. Men were left in hunger. Men were cleared as far as their sins were concerned, but they were given no power to, to, to be conquerors over sin as they walked to the next year. So they came back to repeat the whole thing over again. And their conscience wasn't cleared. They were not cleared of the dead works. And uh, he said, this is, in essence, uh, only a shadow of the things to come. But most of all, he says, I remind you that the Holy Spirit was showing them that the way, with all these limitations, that the way into the most holy place had not, had not yet been disclosed. But then he comes to the joyful part. I, if I had been writing this, I would have put another but in here. Notice in 7th verse, I like it says, but, that's to get our attention, but only. An interruption, but only, see. But then in the 11th verse he says, when Christ, here's a good place to put a but. And since the Holy Spirit was inspiring him, we leave it as it is. But there's a good interruption here, for he's changing their thoughts. But when Christ came, when Christ came, as high priest of the good things that are already here, they've forgotten well, Sandy was along, saying something along that line a while ago. Yeah. He went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Yeah. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkle on those who are ceremonially clean, unclean, uh, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death or dead works, as the King James says, so that we may experience God's presence that we may serve the living God, yes. that we may get the direction to find out how to make it true, this wilderness of life. That's all implied right here in by God's mercy. Surely, as the Roman church listened, somebody must have been quickened. Surely, as that small house church of, prime, of people who have been primarily Hebrew children, or maybe all together, people that had followed the Old Testament ways, surely someone must have been quickened. Surely someone must have said, I want more of this meat. Surely someone must have said, I see that we've been given a better thing. Surely someone must have said, oh my goodness, I've experienced the mighty power of God more than the children of Israel have ever experienced. Surely someone said, let us press on. For he exhorts them to do that often. Surely someone must have remembered how great and how merciful God was. Surely someone must have mentioned or must have thought of how great the price is and how wonderful it was that the Hebrew children had to experience the death of thousands, I guess maybe millions of animals. And yet once his blood was shed, it was enough. Not of dumb, helpless animals who had no choice for it was not a mechanical thing. But Christ, knowing that the price must be paid, offered himself, gave his own life. Nothing had to be shed for him for he did God's will perfectly and he was sinless. So he was in himself the perfect sacrifice. But offering him sacrifice did what could never be done and was never done in the Old Testament dispensation. He showed us the way through. Not only did he show us the way through, he made the way through for us. He made the way through to God's presence. And in making the way through, he didn't go through in terror. In making the way through, he went through when he came through as if it were a song, John, as you said. I know the pain and the cross is there, but he said, for the joy that was set before him. I'm so glad God brought that to my mind. He endured these things. He suffered this loss of blood. And getting into God's presence, 
He didn't go by himself, and he never did go out, essentially, spiritually. He never did. And getting into God's presence, he opened up the door and brought you and me right in there also. See, that's a great thing. That's a great thing. If we get that by revelation, we'll have great encouragement. So that when you and I, when you and I get together here, we're already in the heavenlies. We just have to realize by faith where we are. Now, I know it's difficult to live on this earth and, and live in heaven at the same time. But the truth of the matter is, that's where we are. See, through his body, heaven and earth have been brought together. See, heaven and earth have kissed. They never did before. They did before. But sin tore us apart. And the material was joined to the eternal. See, eternal redemption. And in being joined together, he joined us like that. Being his, being his brothers by the blood. He is our elder brother. He lifts us to the very presence of God. Not just once a year, every day. Every morning. Every, all day. At night. On an airplane. In a car. So was right down here at the railroad tracks. And Brother Helm picked us over at Anderson one day. And got us in the car. Well, Bar- Barbara and I were going over to hear Brother, Brother Mark's ch- uh, Brewer's Church. Where he was preaching. Some little country church over there. And we got up to the, we got up to the railroad trestle. The glory of God was so great. Brother Helm said, if we can get this out of the car. If we get this meeting out of the car. And get it into the, uh, into the sanctuary over there. I said, how great it'll be. Oh, I remember. Oh, man, I'll never forget. Sandy, your exhortation was so wonderful. Yeah. May I never forget. Amen. Because you see, we, we were just nobodies. Yeah. We really were. I could, I'd had a coat that I couldn't button. Not because I had any waistline much. It was simply because I didn't have the money. To buy. I never thought much about it. But I didn't have the money. My brother gave me my coat. Uh-huh. It took my money to feed the family and to go to school. I didn't have money to buy clothes. So I had a, a suit and a coat. Suit given to me by Ronnie, the coat by Terry. And I couldn't button them. I didn't worry about it. Don't button them now much anyway. I can button this one this morning because I've lost seven or eight pounds since I've been here. But uh, I usually can't. But I'm taking back to the fact that, that this man of God loved us so much and we were nobodies. I was about to be cast out. See, I was on a trail to try to follow God. And it, make, it didn't make any difference what what I had to have. I wanted to be what God wanted me to be and I wanted to follow and it didn't make any difference to price. When tongues were so popular, I thought, well, if it takes that, I'll have that too. And a a man of God told me from the West somewhere, he said, now son, don't get in search of a gift, just get in search of the Holy Spirit. See, that helped me. Reverend Guttenfelder told me that. He said, just be in search of the giver. But see, I didn't care what it was. I didn't do, well, whatever. I said, Jesus, by God's grace, I'm not concerned. Something's wrong. We're we're living, we're living in an operation of dead flesh and of dead works. And how glad do you think I am that Jesus helped me? How glad you think I was when this man of God came by. When we went from Alaska through Memphis the other day and we stopped by way of Memphis, Tennessee, well, I sanctified the place afresh. Why? Because I walked on the banks of the Mississippi there and it was on those banks after I had read Reese Howe's Intercessor, I said, oh God, this man's dead. I said, Lord, if there's a man alive that loves thee and walks with thee like the men of the Old and New Testament, I want to meet him before I die. And I cried and prayed on those banks day after day after day. A young boy, not out of college yet, and not married yet, no children, yet I prayed, oh, Jesus, I want to meet him before I die. That prayer was to be answered six years later. God was to have mercy on me. So when we landed in Memphis, Tennessee, I was a holy place for me. I said, oh, I've been on the banks of the Mississippi here, and I prayed, and God answered that prayer. But when we got to those, that railroad trestle out here, those tracks, when we got there, well, I remembered how great God's glory was. Oh, if I could be more simple. Oh, if I could just live in this sunshine. I can, but I'm rethinking back on how glorious experience this was and how the tree of I just, It just seemed like talking. Renelli, we were over the rainbow. We were, we were there. We were over the rainbow. And I know we didn't have the redemption of the body yet, but see, we were in the heavenlies and Christ was guiding and God was leading. You can't get any better than that unless uh, the Holy Ghost revival come and Jesus comes back. Uh, right in there, I'll get better. But it just seemed like to me, oh, it was so wonderful. And I kind of wanted everybody in it. And I try to get and tell a few people about it. I just start to tell people in their eyes and go glassy. Yeah. 
They don't even know what I'm talking about. Say, so, oh, I said, you know, Jesus was in the car. That's nice. Well, that's more than nice. It never happened before Calvary. Never got in a car before Calvary. Not the way he was. When the blood of Jesus came, the glory of God. See, because of that shed blood, we had we were in the sanctuary of the Most High God right in an automobile. See, it's great. Jesus said the day is coming when you can worship him anywhere. Oh, how great that he said, and it's now here. He, he was here. He was ready to die and so that you and I could experience God's presence anywhere on the face of this earth, having asked forgiveness for our sins, and that's another aspect we're going to deal with, what it really means to thoroughly deal with these sins and to have them removed forever and forever and to have not only forgiveness from God but to have the guilt taken away. Cooper got a hold of that when he wrote, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. I don't know that he kept the vision, according to what I read about his biography, but he had it once. Wonderful. May God help us to keep the vision. Yes. And in a sense, those who are in the remnant ministries the ministers that are not accepted by organized Christianity want to not downgrade or unappreciate, to be unappreciative of our heritage. They can't be or we invalidate everything that's coming. But we do want to realize what, where God has brought us to. We do want to realize that unless the Holy Spirit's leading the service, we're serving Him all over again in dead works. We would want to realize that as the works are dead, it becomes a barrier between us and God. And objectively, he's dealt with it. There's no need for that to be anymore. There's no need. The, the, the rules for worship are what? To follow the Holy Spirit. These were once for a time to be a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But when the way became clear, then we were to follow him. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful that he said no more hardly in the, the Bible than follow me? Yeah, let's follow me. Follow me. Follow me. And the way in worship is to follow him. Follow him. Follow him. Follow him. I, I knew there was a great need in my life. I knew that I could go to church and I would wait. I would go to church for years and I'd wait for some food to come to my soul. And maybe the preacher would preach on the latest political thing or maybe he'd preach on something over here or something over there. And, and I loved him. And I, and I waited. But I waited for that moment of glory. Just for that tremor to come into my soul where the food came down from heaven. But I waited and I waited and I waited. And if I ever hit a place, brother, you knew about it because I was happy. <laughs> oh, I just wait. Just, you know, I'm just searching for the crumb. Just searching for the crumb. I got very little, could find very little beneath the table. But I'll tell you that one day God opened up a table, if you please. Brother Helm doesn't call it anything but a crumb, but to me it was a table compared to what I had. And, and the table was spread for us that night before the railroad tracks. The table was spread for us one night in our home. The night Ronald Reagan was elected president, I mean governor of California, he came in that night. He'd been to hear East Stanley Jones, and he came down to our house. And he stayed, I think, for about five hours. God opened up. A wonderful table for us that night. Wasn't that wonderful? Oh, what a, what a gracious thing. What a great thing. God was helping us and answering the desires of our heart. But oh, what we felt of God's presence. See, where two or three are gathered, is it something that the Jewish people are required to have ten people? But Christ said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of this. Isn't that a great thing? It's not anything down on them. To have a menu, that's a great thing. But oh, just think, two or three of us can get together in the glory falls. I mean having all things clear. Because we've been raised to the heavenlies with him. Furthermore, we can find a way through. I know it's like a wilderness quite a bit. But in actuality, we've already arrived. We're already in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. And there he rules. That's the reason he's crying through the writer of the Hebrews. Oh, that men would hear my voice today. Why? Because there's a way through. Oh, that men would hear my voice today. I, I want you to know this goes in a straight line, not in circles. It's not a wilderness experience. It may seem like a wilderness. It may seem like worse than a wilderness. But in following Christ, there's a way through. We're on our way somewhere. There's purpose and there's glory and there's meaning. That's why I'm here. Come and pray. Go to Scott Depot. 
take trips abroad. Latest word from God, come to pray. If, if in fact, the latest is just keep praying. Well, that's great. Now, I want you to know that goes somewhere. <laughs> that goes somewhere because he's directing from his session. He, Jesus said this goes somewhere. The Holy Ghost said this goes somewhere. So, I know I'm in a wilderness. It's in a wilderness to live in a rented home in Parker and have school starting and have a nice home back home and having missed many of the conveniences and have problems that you, to test your nerves. Because they've been raised to the heavenlies with him. Right. Furthermore, we can find a way through. Yeah. I know it's like a wilderness quite a bit, but in actuality, we've already arrived. Thank you. We're already in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. And there he rules. That's the reason he's crying through the writer of the Hebrews. Oh, that men would hear my voice today. Why? Because there's a way through. Oh, that men would hear my voice today. I, I want you to know this goes in a straight line, not in circles. It's not a wilderness experience. It may seem like a wilderness. It may seem like worse than a wilderness. But in following Christ, there's a way through. We're on our way somewhere. There's purpose and there's glory and there's meaning. That's why I'm here. Come and pray. Go to Scott Depot. Take trips abroad. Latest word from God, come to pray. If, if, in fact, the latest is just keep praying. Well, that's great. Now, I want you to know that goes somewhere. <laughs> that goes somewhere because he's directing from his session. He, Jesus said this goes somewhere. The Holy Ghost said this goes somewhere. So, I know I'm in a wilderness. It's in a wilderness to live in a rented home in Parker and have school starting and have a nice home back home and having missed many of the conveniences and have problems that you to test your nerves and things, even though you've made it far more comfortable than it would have been, that's a situation. And not to know what to do, the latest problem is, how do we get Naomi a piano? Because we're so concerned about a piano. How do we do that? Betty doesn't have one. And she, the, the, you can't hardly get in on the school piano because they're teaching voice and piano after school. So we don't know just, that's not, a, that's not the supreme problem of the earth, I promise you. So we're not treating it like that. But now it's a certain problem. And after this world can go this way and this world can go this way and it's going like this and it's going like this and first thing you know it's like this and then some other storm comes through and you've got to have help. But all the while above that is the leading of the Holy Spirit. Come and pray. Keep praying. Come and pray. Keep praying. Now we're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. If I go back and try to take care of my own ministry, I'd be back. I'd be literally back in the wilderness. I'd go back. See, I can't go back. Is it significant that the Holy Spirit would say that the book of Hebrews was so crucial to this hour? The book of meat? Most all that Paul writes is written to the carnal church. Unfortunately, this is written to the carnal church too, but it was supposed to be written to a spiritual church. The beats in this book. Most all that he wrote is written to a carnal church. Don't steal. Don't murmur. Don't complain. Well, this book doesn't say that. It's on a much higher level. But Paul had to deal constantly with little infant carnal churches but this letter which probably came out of his life in preaching is much higher than that and it's the letter that will feel the great need of the hour it's the letter for the mature church it's the letter for Christians who have been looking for the answers it's the letter that points us beyond Calvary beyond the resurrection beyond the incarnation to where he's been now for 2,000 years at the right hand of the Father. And it says he's reigning. He's putting all things under his feet. He's making us sons of God indeed. And he can tell us what to do and he can help us to get truth because he is the way. The way now has been revealed. Oh, how wonderful. May the Holy Spirit lift us this morning in faith to know that we're in a wonderful place since the blood of Jesus has been shed. May Jesus help us to walk by faith even when we don't feel his presence because he's there all the while anyway. We're weak. We're very weak. And we need his help. Yes. Well, his help is there. He's talking. He's praying. All the while he's praying. 
the Holy Spirit living within us is sending up prayers himself. There's two prayers going on, one within us and one beside the throne. Also, he's speaking, oh, that men would hear my voice. He wants to tell us where to take our next step. And though many things, minor things are in a world, the major problem is being solved. He's taking care of our sins, and he's doing something for us that never could be done in the Old Testament. He's giving us power to live, to conquer sin. He's giving us power. He's put within us a desire to be holy, and he's, he's sanctifying us, bringing us to perfection. And may not think he's doing so much, but he's doing more than you think. If you're looking at him and following him, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Why don't we be faithful? Why do we have to go by the climate of, and the atmosphere of the moment to be faithful? Why don't we just be faithful? Having had this word of God written down for us, and it's so great. This is just Matthew to Revelation and the Psalms. There's enough right in there to keep us at the faithful post right there. But God's done enough in your life and my life already from the reigning of his session of his high priestly ministry to keep us faithful. And then as Sandy said, let us review. Let us review. Let us review that we've been saved. Let us review that he's the high priest. Let us review that he has delivered us. Let us review that it's wonderful to walk with him. Let us review that he has given us enough by way of example that he has the ultimate answer for us in terms of our destiny. Let us review that so we can bask in the promises of God and have the revelation that the promise that the future is as bright as the promises of God. Truth of the matter is you wouldn't be here this morning if you didn't believe that anyway. So we're here to celebrate. We're here, we're here basking in it. But I'm an exhorter by God's grace and a preacher. And I'm to try to lead us to higher ground. All the while trying to get to higher ground myself. Glory be to God forevermore. Now, like Emory, I've mused my way through without mastering the subject. I don't know that I ever will. But maybe I opened up something for you. Maybe these first 14 verses now are a little different than they've ever been before. I have always skipped chapter number 9. I can't do it anymore. Throughout my ministry. I'm 50 years old. been preaching since I've been 15 years old. I've always jumped 9. Why? The blood's such a mystery. The sacred blood of Christ. Necessary, but such a ministry. I just plead it and go on. Now I'm required to make some explanation. I can't skip it anymore. And so you got it this morning. Why? Why? Because it's the way through. I've got to follow. There's some help in it for us by God's grace. He wants us on the higher ground. So we sanctify the higher ground in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.